Greetings, I'm Les Pollard, and this is Windows on the Word. We come to you on a weekly basis from the beautiful campus of Oakwood University, where we plunge into Scripture in order to determine how these wonderful precepts can apply to our everyday lives and to enrich them, not only as individuals, but also collectively. How we can make an impact, not just around the corner, but around the world. So we're very grateful to be here with you today. And we're talking about faith and politics in this Windows on the Word segment. And my two guests again are here and I'm so excited because they have so much to share. As a matter of fact, off camera, I had just said to them after overhearing them have a discussion, I said, have you ever just stopped to think how much understanding and wisdom and knowledge God has entrusted to you across your lifetime? Because what you just shared with me Half the world has never even heard that before. And they were just talking about it very casually. So I thank God for their humility, but I also thank God for their presence tonight. Dr. Cliff Jones is the dean of our School of Theology here at Oakwood University. And then uh, Dr. Gilbert Ajwang is the chair of the Department of Religion in that same very School of Theology. Gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's, thank a, it's, you, it's thank my you, pleasure. Thank you. We're glad to be here. My pleasure. So this is a hot topic, gentlemen, faith and politics. And let's begin our conversation by starting with Scripture. Let's start with Scripture because this represents, this Scripture I'm about to read, represents one understanding of government. And let me say in terms of big picture, we're going to have two understandings of government. They both are in 13. Romans 13, we'll start there. And then in the next segment, we'll talk about Revelation 13. So we put these two 13s together and we get some sort of picture of government. So let, let's talk about Revelation, thir uh, excuse me, Romans 13, 1 says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Man, that's a frightening passage, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Frightening passage. You know, this is a passage that was um, used against Dr. King. So, give, MLK. Give us, yeah, MLK. G give us some understanding of, of what this passage is calling for and, and why it's even calling for that. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Pollard. Let me first say that politics in and of itself, mm -hmm. it, as, you, as you mentioned, it's a hot button item mm -hmm. because politics has a pejorative uh, meaning, connotation, so mm -hmm. forth or so on. It's a bad word. Mm -hmm. It's a word that needs to be rehabilitated, mm -hmm. politics. Um, you know, people, people do not think well of uh, politics. There are some underlying or undergirding principles, however, when we begin to talk about politics. One being that uh, we are, again, we are in the world, but not of the world, mm -hmm. yet we are to render to Caesar the mm -hmm. things that are Caesar's, mm -hmm. and we are to pray for all leaders, and we are to support those who have been legitimately elected mm -hmm. as our leaders. So, 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 Dr. Jones, one of the questions we have is what should be the believer's relationship to government, and what does this kind of passage mean? Is it calling for total submission to government, irrespective of whether we believe a policy is just or unjust? As I said earlier, Dr. Martin Luther King, in his letter from a Birmingham jail, was responding to the Southern white clergy who were quoting often this passage, saying you just need to submit and let time run its course and these things will fix themselves. And of course, Dr. King had an elaborate answer for that. But what, what do you, tell me, <clears throat> what does a passage like this mean in the 21st century? Thank you, Doc Pollard. Um, let me first say in terms of politics that uh, we know that politics in and of itself, um, it had, there's a pejorative connotation mm -hmm. to when we begin to talk about uh, politics. Uh, there are people who, who are turned off by the notion of mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that politics needs to be the, the, uh, rehabilitated, mm -hmm. as it were. But, but that's, that's, uh, that's for different 
and another time. I've been thinking about uh, what you just asked in the context of what has happened recently mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the death of Queen Elizabeth and how power has been transferred. Mm -hmm. And I listened to uh, a, uh, a, a, a program. I looked uh, at uh, the transfer of power and they talk about that the king now is the sole legitimate and, and, and proper um, ruler. And all of these uh, former pre uh, prime ministers and so forth, they win that rule and they, you know, and they, wow. they are ready to render homage mm -hmm. to, uh, to this person. I said, hmm, interesting. Now, we have been told as an underlying principle in terms of governments that we must render to Caesar mm -hmm. the things that are Caesar's um, that we must obey, uh, we must submit. Um, and yet we, 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 we also know that we must submit to the extent that uh, what we've been asked to do does not fly in the face of some of the very important principles. Mm -hmm. For example, if a law is unjust, then we have been told in scripture it's better to obey God mm -hmm. than man. Mm -hmm. And the Fugitive Slave Act uh, mm -hmm. is evidence of that. Uh, when that act was passed, Ellie White, uh, one of the founders of our denomination uh, talked about that that, was, that law was not to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. That law was not obe to be mm -hmm. obeyed. And she encouraged uh, members not to obey that law. So yes, we uh, support our leaders, we pray for our leaders, so forth and so on. But if they are enacting legislation that flies in the face of some very basic and underlying principles of truth and honesty and justice and equity and fairness, then those uh, dictates we are not to obey. Wow, wow. Doctor? Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Pollard. What many people forget when they read that passage, and thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Dr. Jones, mm -hmm. is the fact and that... And that passage is Romans 13. Romans 13, yes. yes. Romans mm -hmm. 13. Mm -hmm. It talks about authorities that have been established by God. Mm -hmm. So we focus on authorities and forget that they were established by God. Mm -hmm. God is the author of government. Mm -hmm. God is the author of power. In fact, if you read the Bible, you'll notice that God is comfortable uh, making humans to be prophets. Mm -hmm. God is comfortable making them priests. Mm -hmm. God is comfortable making them judges. Mm -hmm. But God is very reluctant when he is forced to give power to humans to exercise authority. Mm -hmm. And that's why kingship, even in ancient Israel, was, regulated, was uh, right. highly regulated mm -hmm. and, and came last. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying in Romans 13, that authority has to be one that exercises its power, its authority in harmony with God. Mm. Yes. So uh, yes, to the extent that governments exercise their authority in harmony with God, and we know what what God would would, would have us do, mm -hmm. as, as as stated in the Bible, Amen. then such an authority is easy to to obey and to be subject to. Amen. 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 Well, let's think about some people in history who said government was not acting according to God's dictates. Uh, William Wilberforce, mm -hmm. right? William Wilberforce lifelong opponent to British slavery, right? Uh, we can think of other examples of, of people who saw that government, even if it was church government, was coercing the conscience, mm -hmm. Martin Luther, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have these examples of resistance, yeah. right? So how do we know when to resist? And Dr. Jones, you gave us, a, already you gave us a first key mm -hmm. that we ought to obey God rather than rather man, than mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We ought to obey God. Um, are there other keys that we need to use when we look at the effect of a policy? And how do we lift our voice? This mm -hmm. is, these are the questions that young people often have. Okay. They say, why aren't we out there in the market square when clearly the actions take climate change? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Take climate change. Yeah. Um, clearly there are actions of government that are endangering the populace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And of course, one can shake out on one side or, or the other, or maybe even the third side. But how does one use their faith to guide them through the maze of those things that people say are political? How does one, how does one? 
Who wants to take a shot at that? You can go first. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the, again, um, the key is God's commandment of love. Love for God and love for your neighbor. And love for neighbor then mm -hmm. extends to even the command. The, the Ten Commandments actually yes. are mm -hmm. a summary of, the, of love. Mm -hmm. So how do we tell when a government is going contrary to the principles of God's government? Mm -hmm. Because government originates from God. Mm -hmm. So we should disobey and agitate mm -hmm. and openly oppose mm -hmm. any law, any policy of government that goes contrary to scripture. Mm -hmm. So how do we know? So, that says the Lord. Start with the scripture. Yeah. That's right. Got you. Mm -hmm. Got you. And Good. then, of course, our conscience, our conscience, uh, mm -hmm. not, not just our individual conscience, mm -hmm. but the collective conscience, <clears throat> the conscience of a community, uh, will help us to uh, determine again what ought to be embraced, what ought to be uh, followed, mm -hmm. what ought to be implemented, and what ought to be ignored mm -hmm. or just thrust aside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, these are some keys that we can use to make sure that we are moving in accordance with our faith and that we are, being, we are practicing a faithful discipleship as we interface with the modern world. One of the things that strikes me as I think about this very important topic is that Romans 13 actually presents government on its best day. This is a blue sky presentation of what government should do. It's ordained by God. Mm -hmm. It carries out His will. It protects us. It, these are ministers of righteousness. Now, if that were the only picture of government in the Bible, then, wow, we'd have some challenges. But that's Romans 13. Revelation 13 presents another picture of government, government that looks like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. And how should we then relate when we have those kinds of expressions of government that are going to seek to compromise the conscience? And even now, that often compromises the conscience. So what does that mean? What does Revelation 13 mean for the role of government in the end time? That's what we're going to take up when we come back from the break. It's going to be a fascinating discussion. And when we put these two 13s together, Romans 13 and Revelation 13, we'll have an even clearer picture of how we should live in these uncertain times. May God bless you. And we'll see you when you, we come back. We'll see you right after the break. Why I'm here? I'm here because God has called and asked me to be here, and it's a privilege to serve Open University. It's not only a place where loveliness abounds, but it's a place where excellence abounds on a daily basis. Why am I here? Because it's a privilege, because God has asked, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to serve in this capacity. Welcome back, and we're here at Windows on the Word, and we're talking about the role of government and every disciple's relationship to it. Now, Romans chapter 13 presents a picture of government that we would say is a blue sky picture of government. This is government at its best. It enforces laws that edify and support citizenry. It, um, it protects citizens. Uh, those who execute government are ministers of righteousness, according to that text. On the other hand, at the end of the Bible, Reve Revelation chapter 13 gives us another picture of government, government that looks like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. So here is a government that in its very nature is contradictory, if not, if not outright hypocritical. Mm -hmm. Now that causes us to pause for a moment and to ask ourselves some questions. How should we live when government has betrayed its Roman 13 roots mm. and has become something other than what God originally established for it. So, Revelation 13 is one of the great passages in the Adventist canon of last day events. It's an important passage. Uh, many have noted that it talks about America in prophecy. The earliest Adventist pioneers certainly accepted that. They saw it as a, as a prophetic word that's going to take place in which conscience would be coerced at the end uh, because that passage calls for, says that, that all who both small and great will be forced to accept the mark, 
and the image of the beast, etc., etc. So here we are, living in the end times, colleagues. Mm. How do we then live in the face of a government that speaks with two voices? Now, here, here's what I want to qualify, and then you all, you all take it on. You take it on. Okay. Not will speak, <laughs> but does speak right now. And, and here's why I say that, Dr. Jones. Because the early Adventist pioneers, whether it's J. and Andrews or James White, they used, or Uriah Smith, they used as evidence mm -hmm. of the duplicity of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. They used the enslavement of Africans as Exhibit A of the contradictory nature, the claims of the Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. and the subservience, the subjugation of these disenfranchised African immigrants that be, were being held in slavery. Okay, who wants to go first? Well, we um, obviously Revelation 13 calls for discernment yes. on our part, courage mm -hmm. on our part, and a willingness to bite the bullet, as it were, and to give evidence of how we feel at the polls, mm -hmm. at the polls. We haven't talked much about voting yet, the mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the ballot. And uh, of course, Revelation 13 also lets us know that force will be used, but mm -hmm. that's, that's at a higher level. But fundamentally, um, as, as we begin to deal with a government that we recognize is saying one thing and doing something else, mm -hmm. we can let our voices be heard at the polls. Yes. yes. At the polls. Powerful. We, we vote them out. Powerful. You know, Powerful. we may have to put up with this for four years, but we vote them out. Powerful. Yes. Powerful. And, and beside voting them out, we need to speak up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Far too long we have kept quiet mm -hmm. in the face of um, bad governance, yes. uh, oppressive government. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from Africa, mm -hmm. I can't help but think of apartheid South wow. Africa, wow. Wow. where for many years, uh, the majority black people did not have any power mm -hmm. in their own country. And yet as a church, I don't think that we did enough. Mm -hmm. We capitulated to Romans 13, mm -hmm kind of hid under the cover of Romans 13. Romans 13. But Romans 13 clearly mm -hmm. envisages a government that is acting in harmony with God's principles. Mm -hmm. And yet the one in South Africa wasn't. Was not. And many of the oppressive governments around the world have not, mm -hmm. including the one in Revelation 13 mm -hmm. that speaks like a dragon but mm -hmm. looks like a lamb. Mm -hmm. I think that we are called upon to do the same thing that the early Adventist pioneers did. Mm -hmm. They called it out as Exhibit A, mm -hmm. the act of slavery. Mm -hmm. We should call as Exhibit B mm -hmm. all oppressive rules that continue to be either in our books today mm -hmm. or practiced mm -hmm. Im implicitly or, uh, or, or practice um, uh, kind of discriminative Yes. Actions, yes. Uh, action. So, so uh, the, the government recognizes under civil rights that a person can be discriminated at a place of work on the basis of race mm -hmm. and things and like gender. that. So, gender. so and gender and so on. We should use that to speak loudly against uh, those duplicities. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a part of the witness that's expected of us, isn't mm -hmm. it? Our, our young people certainly. Yeah. think about the world in this way, and they wonder, why are we quiet in the face of these kinds of obvious discriminations? Mm -hmm. How do you discern, the word you used, uh, Dr. Jones, how do you begin to differentiate concerns? How do you differentiate, for lack of a better term, an ordinary pedestrian ballot issue, one mil or two mil for the tax rate, uh, increase, right, mm -hmm. versus a, sub, an, an, a consuming moral concern that cannot be segregated from, um, 
from po political and, and moral action. I'm, and the reason I use that word segregated, um, in my study of, of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968, when he was talking about the uh, Vietnam War, and they didn't want him to talk about the war. They wanted to mm -hmm. restrict him to civil rights, mm -hmm. American civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I remember what Dr. King said to Ralph Abernathy, uh, but he wasn't talking to Ralph, to mm -hmm. Pastor Abernathy. He was talking out loud, but he was speaking to Ralph. He said, it does not matter what they say. I will not have my, I will not segregate Mm. That was his word, my moral concerns. Mm -hmm. I will not segregate the immorality of civil injustice is the same immorality mm -hmm. that drives the war effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same immorality. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and, and that, that is true. Um, what is also true, I'm sure you've heard the uh, saying that all politics is local yes. yes all politics is local it all comes home yes, it comes it home to where you it are does. it does uh, your community your home your family your school district mm -hmm. you see uh, the environment where you are etc so yeah it's all we, we have to be concerned about global uh, issues as far as the environment and environment are concerned but we also must be concerned about what's happening in our little neck of the woods amen because all politics is local amen amen I've, we've said to our students uh, dr. Ajwang that uh, especially during the times when there was very much agitation around policing in our mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. within the last two or three years uh, yes along with agitating we'd like to encourage you to join the police force Department. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some things you can change from the outside in and Excellent. some you change from the inside from the out. Inside out. Go, Go ahead and join the police force. We yeah. need you yeah. to become uh, police a, officers. A good mm -hmm. police officer. Yeah. yeah. If, we, mm -hmm. if we don't have, if we're complaining about uh, police officers who are That's not right. acting professionally, That's right. we need some young people who can go in and act professionally. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't like the movies coming out of Hollywood? That's right. Okay, yeah. go be a film producer. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Give God something to work with. Yeah. That's right. Beyond right. our criticism. Come beyond say, our criticism. Beyond our criticism. Yeah. The criticism may be in play. But give God something to work with. Yeah. Doctor, yeah. you wanted to speak. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, it is not difficult to know when government acts out of harmony with God's words. Mm -hmm. uh, God created human beings in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Equal. Mm -hmm. men and women. Mm -hmm. And so any policy, any culture, any structure that oppresses mm -hmm. men or oppresses women, mm -hmm. oppresses poor people, disadvantages mm -hmm. uh, foreigners, is bad policy. Mm -hmm. And we have to speak against them Amen. and do what is in our power to stop them. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what's also true is that all these bad policies benefits somebody, fattens someone's pocketbook. And there are times when these terrible policies are benefiting some of our own people, as it were, and they yes. won't speak up. They won't blow the uh, trumpet, as it mm -hmm. were, and that's mm -hmm. unfortunate. Amen. Amen. And this that gets back to the ethics and morals that you talked about earlier. Yes, absolutely. I, Isaiah 58, uh, which we referenced in a previous broadcast, Isaiah 58 reminds us that we're not to benefit from oppression. Mm -hmm. And that was a part of the dilemma that the mm -hmm. people were having in mm -hmm. Isaiah's day. Mm -hmm. And God said, we've got we've to revoke it. In fact, mm -hmm. The, the last verses, last set of verses, have to do with true Sabbath keeping, mm -hmm. and Sabbath keeping is connected mm -hmm. to doing justice, right, mm -hmm. and to doing mm -hmm. it, and to doing mercy, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's what God calls us to. Yes. W one of the things that I think about, and that we think about here at Oakwood University, is how can we do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly? Mac Micah chapter six, verse eight, um, and that's the call of this kind of discussion. What should be the role of disciples in the face of government? Government that on its best days does what God asks it to do, and then on its worst days, it certainly does not. We believe here at Oakwood University that we are to be faithful wherever we find ourselves and in whichever set of circumstances we find ourselves. 
not only must we advocate, we must agitate. And we deploy young people by the thousands. We say, go into the halls of legislature and don't just go there to make a dollar, go there to make a difference. Mm. We thank you for tuning in to Windows on God's Word, Windows on the Word. Thank you from the beautiful campus of Oakwood University. Go to our website. There you can support the kind of work that we are doing at www.oakwood.edu. And there you'll have the opportunity to become a faith partner as we advance the ministry and the mission of this 125-year-old institution. I'm Les Pollard. I'll see you the next time on Windows on the Word. Hi, my name is Gary Graham II, and this is my Oakwood story. Okay, so my Oakwood story kind of begins before I got here. I applied to about 25 schools. Um, I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go. Um, I ended up getting to about 22 of them, and I actually had put down my deposit at another school. Somebody, a representative from Oakwood came and gave me a large scholarship. I kind of thought that Oakwood is the place I needed to be. I was a psychology major, and then I was kind of like, mm, this is not really what I'm interested in, so I kind of went out to explore. So I went to the bio department, and I went to the chem department, and I really clicked with my advisor, Dr. Stephen Lahing, so now I'm a biochemistry major. I'm going to be graduated with a BS in biochemistry. My teachers had a great impact on my academic life, and if I can just say this and slip that in there, my advisor, he's really... He's really a godsend because I could go to him about anything, not just academics, but everything. But so much academics, um, in terms of always being open for office hours and going above and beyond to have their doors open for me and stuff, concepts I didn't understand, I could always go to them about anything. So that's what, I really think that's the biggest impact. They actually care. Whereas I talk to other people that go to other schools and they're just like, yeah, office hours from 12 to 2, that's it. I'm not gonna stay. I'm not gonna do anything for you. Everything's up to you. The teachers at Oakwood and my department and the classes I've taken actually care. Well, after graduation, I've applied to seven MPH programs. So far, I've been accepted to two, Columbia University and Emory University. I have five more that I'm waiting on, five more acceptances or denials, hopefully acceptances. But I have five more that I'm working on. After my MPH, I plan on going to medical school, getting an MD degree, and becoming an orthopedic surgeon. coming and it won't be long no I fly away to my home that was nice thank you I'll be so happy that I'll sing a new song I fly away to my home Now no more pain, <laughs> no more sorrow, <laughs> no more crying, and no tomorrow, no, I fly away. When the time come, when the time come, I fly away to my home. When the time come, when the time come, I fly away to my home. Now maybe the morning or maybe the evening, but I'll fly away to my home. Now maybe the noonday, but soon I'll be leaving. I'll fly away to my home. Yes, 
myself fly away to where we to belong. Home. Now I wanna be ready. I've gotta be ready to fly away to my home. Oh, 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 oh my house is in order. Oh, my faith holding steady. Fly away to my to home. My Hi, my name is Trevon Johnson, and this is my Oakwood story. My Oakwood story started um, in pre-K. <laughs> um, I attended the Child Development Lab over by Cooper Complex, and then from grades one through 12, I attended Oakwood Adventist Academy. Um, I graduated Oakwood Adventist Academy May 2017 and enrolled into Oakwood University uh, August 2017, um, starting off as a management information systems major and a recording arts minor the end of my sophomore year that I realized what I wanted to do with my MIS degree. And that's because I had an internship with SAIC, NASA's Communication Service, here in Huntsville over at Redstone Arsenal. Then the third year, I um, decided I wanted to learn Spanish. And so <laughs> I uh, just up and went to Argentina through the university's ACA program with the little bit of Spanish that I knew from high school, which didn't really do much for me. So I went essentially knowing nothing. It was a completely immersive experience. Um, it took me about three to four weeks to even understand the most basic things that people were saying to me. And I can confidently say I speak Spanish today. So that was my third year. Um, then when I was, I was told that when I would get back from Argentina, because I spent the full year there, um, it would take only three classes to have a Spanish major. Now I am in my final year, fifth and final year. Uh, I am the senator of the School of Business and Information Systems, and I'll be graduating with a double major, dual degree um, in management information systems and Spanish with a minor in recording arts. I think, and I mean, this is kind of calling the biggest Oakwood cliche, but uh, Oakwood truly is what you make it. I have the ability to work in one of the big four accounting firms of the world. I had an offer from JP Morgan. I've been offered to be the um, IT resident for Advent Health. All these opportunities came from things that happened at Oakwood. So after graduation, I'll be moving to Houston, Texas to work with one of the big four accounting firms, KPMG. I'll be working with clients um, doing software asset management, software licensing, and uh, things like that. And so I'm very excited to see what that future is going to hold. Welcome back to another episode of Verified. I'm your host, Chap P, and I'm back with the team. 
We got Keelan, we got Jill, we got Nat, and we have Donovan. So as we said last week, we're going to follow up on this very important conversation about sex. And we mentioned a lot of things last week, but we didn't really get into something that I want to tackle today. Um, is there any wisdom? Is there any wisdom behind um, not having sex before marriage? Like something you guys mentioned is like, okay, well... People are just like, well, I just feel like that's not for me. I mean, we discussed certain things. We discussed it based on the fact that it's a sin. But do you think there's any wisdom behind it? Like, Donovan, you're saying, like, nowadays you want to hear, folk don't just want to hear, oh, we just don't do that. So do you think there's any wisdom behind waiting until you get married? Like, aside from just what the Bible says, aside from the fact that it's considered sin in Scripture, do you think there's any wisdom behind it? Absolutely. I mean, I was talking about how because, um, you know, God created us in his image. I think a lot of his laws mirror reasoning and, and logic. And he, he could just see all of the experiences that we would go through even after the fall of sin um, or the fall after sin. Um, and, of course, there's wisdom in it. I mean, dare we say that there's something you said, of course, it's God's word. So we know there has to be wisdom in it. But we talked about soul ties. We talked about the emotional consequences. We talked about. Um, in the previous episode, how just creating that bond with someone um, outside of the blessing of God can really just have the inverse impact that it would have, you know, mm -hmm. if you decided to be married. So I don't really know how to expand on that. I mean, that could materialize in a bunch of different ways, whether, you know, somebody gets pregnant and you have a kid, which is another variable that's impacted by that negative, you know, influence of, of the initial decision. Um, it, it could just many, many it, it could spin off many different yeah. ways, many, yeah. most of which are, are not positive. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so yeah. I think okay. there's plenty of wisdom in that. Okay, so there is some wisdom. You see some wisdom. All right. You need to know if you're prepared. Prepared in what way? <laughs> before you before you do it, that uh, before you have uh, sex before marriage. Prepared, like just in case, let's say a, a child comes along, or what, what do you mean by prepared? Yeah, like. Wrap do up, you or? have your life planned out? You say what though? Uh, you mean like we're protection? Like what do you mean be prepared? I'm saying like, are you ready for a family? Okay. Are you ready to take on responsibility? Should okay. that responsibility come yeah. unplanned? Mm -hmm. You know, if it's if if a child comes unplanned in the context of a marriage, well then he or she is just coming sooner than anticipated. Mm -hmm. But you guys will still make adjustments in order to, to provide a, a home and a foundation. So that's, that's kind of what you're getting to, right? Yeah, and then you also have to understand the people who, who get married to have sex as well. Because to me, there's no love in that either. Mm. Mm. So I have a question. I have one as well, but you can go. Okay, okay. Let's go, let's go with Nat and then... Okay, so I don't know if I'm getting at what, what was being said. Um, but my question is, are you suggesting that as long as you're prepared that it's okay to have sex before marriage? Mm. No, I'm this not. Is connected to my question. No, he, <laughs> was, he, he was saying that when you, he was implying that when you are married, then you're prepared. Because if you got married, then I'm assuming. Yeah, that you talked about all this. As long as you get married for the wrong reasons, right. like you were alluding to, <laughs> then you got married, you were prepared for that next step in life. Okay. You know, because you got to be somewhat established in order to get married. You got to have some sort of plan for your life of how you guys are going to be able to survive, pay bills, and all that good stuff. So you're going to have a plan in place already. Okay. Yeah. I have a next question. That, that's your question. Yeah, so, so my question, I think it would be applicable to the situation for a lot of people our age. Um, you have a young couple, maybe they're senior high school, going into college, maybe just graduated from college. And they've been dating for some years now. They're in love, you know, they, they've had time to emotionally you know, develop and, and get to know each other. But they're still not married, right? So having sex at this point would still be a sin. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like they know, or at least they, they sincerely plan on getting married, but they're still not married. Mm -hmm. So for them, what is the appeal to still not because in their mind, they're like, well, we're going to get married anyway. We've been together for this. They may even have a plan, as Keelan said. They may have been planning things out, but they're not quite at the point yeah, at which right. they've been married. Mm -hmm. So for, for a couple in that situation, what then is the appeal yeah, right. to, to, to abstain, wait. to wait? Right, to right. Wait. That's a great uh, question. Uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. Doesn't uh -huh. the Bible tell us, uh, well, ask a question that says, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound within us? Because what, if, I mean, 
just because they say they have a plan, nine times out of ten, that plan may, may be a failed plan, a, an attempt to fail plan. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <laughs> I get what you're saying. I, I do, and I think that's that a great like question. A crap to me. Um, is it all right if I if I get <laughs> a little does. transparent sure. on the show? Absolutely, oh, please. Let's okay. verify. Let me, let me let me get a little transparent. Um, I did not wait mm. as a young person. I did not wait. Um, I am now single again, okay? And I have been single for a number of years now. I definitely am not dealing with that. Why? Because in my, in my years of living, I've actually come to appreciate why God says to wait. Now, when I was young, I couldn't fully appreciate it because I didn't see all the consequences of it. It may not have to, it doesn't have to be something like, oh, you get pregnant out of wedlock or you catch an STD. No, I mean, there is wisdom behind what God gives us. If God is telling us to wait, it's because you have more chances of being happy if you do wait. Now, the thing is that that happiness may not come immediately, but the effects that, that, that come with moving ahead of God's timing, mm -hmm. you feel those later on. And so I've been able to experience that on both ends, both the negative consequences of not waiting. I've been able to see it. The, the longer you live, the more you get to experience in life, and then you start to gain a little wisdom, mm -hmm. and you're just like, oh, shoot. That's why God said that. Mm -hmm. So there is wisdom behind it. You will be happier in the long run if you wait. Mm -hmm. You will have more regrets if you don't. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't develop emotionally and, you, and your relationship can't grow into all God wants it to become if you, if you rush into something that God has set aside. Now to answer your question, what, what incentive is there for the couple? Well, as a couple, you want to be able to operate with the full blessing of God. And you're also saying to God, and this is the thing, you know, when God says set something aside for me and mm -hmm. I say, all right, God, I'm going to honor you by not doing that. Even though I have a desire to, it doesn't mean you're not going to have a desire for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But even if I have the desire to, I'm going to say, all right, God, I know you want me to, to wait until marriage. So I'm going to do that. So I'm placing God first in my relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if I do that, then I'm trusting in him mm. that he's going to then bless when we get into that relationship and that marriage relationship. He's even going to bless our sex life together. You know what I'm saying? He's going to bless all aspects <laughs> of the relationship. You know what I mean? And that's part of the thing. I'm telling God, yes, I have this desire, but I'm going to wait on you. And we're playing We're putting this relationship in your hands and we want you to fully bless this relationship. And um, I think when we do it that way, it gives the couple, it, it really gives a couple, and this is one of the, the things I was saying. I know I'm talking for a minute, but look, <laughs> I've been itching to say this Take for a while because I've experienced, you know, Go ahead. I'm just telling, man, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm going on 41 this oh, year. Wow. I've experienced. Okay. You look good, too. Yeah, you look like you're it. like 31. Yeah, oh, I think so. Like, <laughs> you're so, so kind. Um, <laughs> Nah, but for real, I mean, I've experienced enough of life to oh, see, no. to see like God's wisdom behind it. You know what I mean? You can't really get to know someone on that deeper level when sex comes into the equation too quickly. Mm -hmm. You can't. Mm -hmm. You can't see the red flags. Okay. You you get blinded from red flags. Burning you can't flags. see you can't see certain characteristics that right now you're just like oh he's just this or oh she's just that because you know it's get it gets covered over by all that other stuff like yeah. there's certain and then you don't want to get to the point in your relationship where you're looking back and you'd be like yo why did why couldn't I ever <laughs> see that you know what I'm saying when when sex creeps in too soon then even the wisdom that might come from your mom or your dad just like I don't know about him I don't know about her well you can't hear that instead you just like oh everybody's against us babe <laughs> No, <laughs> folk trying to look out for you right now, oh, but no. you can't see it's going that. Off. You can't, uh, you know, right? It's like I'm talking to my kid, and he's let not even out, a teenager yet. We can't even see that. So yeah, God has wisdom. God's not trying to keep us mm -hmm. from experiencing anything good. God mm -hmm. created sex. Right. He's not trying to keep us from right. joy. He's not trying to keep us from enjoying right. something that He created. He's trying to keep us from pain. Mm. He's trying to keep us from misery. Trust me when I tell you, a relationship can be really good one year, 
And then five years down the road, you don't know how it's going right, to turn out. Right. So That's what true. I'm saying to God is, look, I'm going to put this whole thing before you because this is a lifelong commitment I'm about to make. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who I'm going to be or who she's going to be in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to put it all in your hands now. Give us the strength to stay pure and then watch God work in that relationship. So that's why I would say to the young couples, it's like, well, we're going to be married anyway. All right. So just keep waiting. It's going to be a struggle. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But keep waiting. I'm engaged right now. Still waiting. Mm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Been dating for a minute now. Still waiting. Mm. <laughs> is it is it a is are there do temptations come from time to sure. time? Of course. But more than anything, we're both committed to saying, you know, God, we trust in you. And so we're going to put this relationship before you. So that's it. I'm done with my spiel. And now we have to go into the break. But we are going to talk. We are going to talk after it because I just, you know, threw a whole bunch of stuff out there. And I want to hear your good opinion. Good stuff. All good stuff. Oh, Great praise stuff. God. Yeah. Praise God. I just want to share what God has, is doing and that God, man, just trust him. You know, God is not trying to keep any good thing from you, but we just have to trust them. So we'll take a break. We'll um, look at a couple of, of advertisements, look at a couple of testimonies, just stick around with us and we will see you on the other side of this break. Why I'm here? I'm here because God has called and asked me to be here and it's a privilege to serve Open University. It's not only a place where loveliness abounds, but it's a place where excellence abounds on a daily basis. Why am I here? Because it's a privilege, because God has asked, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to serve in this capacity. Yo, what's up? It's your boy, E.T., and you're watching OUBN. Hey, part. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. This is Chap P, and I'm sorry. I, I, I became Pastor P for a second yeah. and preached a whole little sermon. Um, but I want to continue on the conversation. Obviously, I shared a lot, and I want to hear what, what you guys think, and, and let's keep continue asking questions and, and, and fleshing this topic out. Well, we need to understand, Chap, that God mm -hmm. cannot bless something that he is not in. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I try to sympathize. With, with people who are dealing with this struggle. <laughs> and <laughs> and this, is, this, is, this is not no judgment from Brother Crumb. This is, just, this is from the heart, what I'm trying to say. Mm. Um, temptation can become a sin, I believe. Um, Break that down. Okay, I will. What I'm saying is, I think when you, when, you do, when you do things for so long or think things for so long, usually you end up taking action on mm. those things, I believe. And so that then it becomes a sin. That's what I'm saying. Mm. And so I think we must we must be careful um, also when we associate ourselves with certain people, um, if we mm. know that there are urges or that there are things, because I think sometimes we, we really do this to ourselves. Self-sabotage. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, I, I don't want to get into that because that's not the topic for mm. today. But I was going to say, I mean, we make it very difficult for ourselves sometimes with even like the music, you know what I'm saying? The stuff that we watch, the stuff that we listen to. I remember growing up, man, I, was, I used to listen to this guy, Joe. I think he's still around nowadays. I don't know. Anyways, I'm not trying to advertise here, but like the music, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly, I was constantly hearing a message that was basically just pushing me towards something. And then, you know, the stuff that we would watch. And, you know, there are a lot of struggles that people deal with. But anyways, that's, that's another topic. Like I said, we don't make it easier on ourselves sometimes. And I think that's what you're alluding to, even with the friend groups. Because there's certain groups that we might hang out in where it's just like, oh, psh, sex before marriage? Uh, yeah, please. And then you trying to be the only one who has a different point of view. And it's, it's, it's peer pressure is real. So anyways, yes, Jill. Um. I think this also ties in with our need to be closer to God mm -hmm. and rooted in our like Christianity, our religion or whatever, because I think about music and even with the music, the new SDA gospel music coming out, it's, it's a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and because we're tainted by society with dance moves, it's like we're cutting up to this gospel music Saturday morning, 
But then the stuff we're doing, <laughs> like how we how we're dancing to it, you know, eh, you know, it's 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 not giving what it's supposed to give, mm -hmm. you know. And then there are even new TikToks out there with a dance, and they do that like dance move to everything. So I've even heard like Kirk Franklin, you know, busting some moves and stuff like that. Um, and I feel like it'd be easier for us to leave certain things if we're closer, you know, to something else. And I have said this, I think when we were going over Dr. Pollard's devotion, but it's like, um, when we're not anchored in certain things, mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to lose your, to yeah. lose your way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we study the Bible more and we're more intact with ourselves and our Christianity rather than other people growing that bond, um, I think it would be harder to be swayed. So. That is such a great point. And like, so that's powerful. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah. Something, something to add on to what Jill was saying was, um, is that people are so focused on, you know, the, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that mindset that they're forgetting about the whole relationship aspect. And I'm always going to stress this when it comes to Christianity and relationship because Christianity is a relationship. Jesus came here to die for us because he loved us. Relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, for me, like, we should view that when it comes to sex before marriage. We should view it in a sense of, I'm not going to do this thing because I love Jesus, because of the relationship that I have with Jesus. That goes back to what Jill was saying, that you have to be anchored in Jesus Christ. So let me break that down. So if, if okay, let's say I have a boyfriend, which I don't, but let's say I have a boyfriend. <laughs> have to clarify. Just, okay, no. Parents. <laughs> have to let you get with parents. <laughs> parents. <laughs> you just let me know. <laughs> let's say I have a boyfriend, right? And, you know, we're growing and, you know, being together or whatever, enjoying each other's presence and stuff, right? And let's say that, you know, whenever we get into arguments, I tend to raise my voice. For him, he don't like me raising my voice mm -hmm. um, because it brings back trauma or mm -hmm. whatever the case is, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next time around, whenever we argue, I'm going to try to not raise my voice mm -hmm. because I don't want to hurt this person. Mm -hmm. So we should think, view it in that same sense of God doesn't like it when we go against what he likes for us. Mm -hmm. We don't have our best interests at heart. We don't. We don't. That's mm -hmm. literally it. We tend to dig ourselves, um, put ourselves in a deeper hole than what it actually should be, and we think that we know what's best for us. Yeah. So overall, what I'm trying to say is we should view it from a standpoint of relationship. What is God, what is my relationship with Jesus? Yeah. How does that look like? Yeah. So. Yeah, there's all kinds of consequences, like I said before, like you said, you, a, lot of, a lot of folk, let's say, you know, we, we've had sex outside of marriage. There's some certain, certain people are currently and they're just like, I don't get what the big deal is. Mm. Again, you'll, you'll get it later. Mm. You may not get it right now, you'll get it later. That's you know true. what I'm saying? It, when you've had, when you've had, you know, let's say one too many partners mm -hmm. and then now you're trying to be in a monogamous situation for the rest of, you know, th there's so many things that we get from society. Like earlier we were talking about, oh, you got to test drive the car before it goes out. Mm -hmm. That's not trusting God. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I'm taking time and I'm praying to God and I'm saying, Lord, bring me somebody. Mm -hmm. God knows what your needs are. Mm -hmm. He's going to bring you somebody who will be able to take those needs. Now, in the meantime, if we're allowing Jesus, that's why I really loved your point. I was saying I love that point. Jesus can take care of my needs for intimacy, even if I'm not engaging in sex, mm -hmm. so that I'm not feeling like I'm missing out on something. Yeah. But when I go and try to fill that in another way, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I want, as we wind down the show, I want to ask this last question because we haven't really said anything about it. Mm -hmm. Do you think then? that maybe this need for sex has something to do with the emotional trauma? Maybe I didn't get the affection or the intimacy that I needed at home, mm -hmm. so I'm getting it in other places, in different forms. Do you think trauma informs one's desire to go out there and to connect on a more deep and intimate level? I would say yes. I think it's situational. Meaning, not every time someone is seeking, you know, physical interaction, 
or, or just looking for sex or some sort of attention that it's because of some trauma they were a victim of in the past. But, but certainly, I think um, even, especially for people who are sexually abused at young ages, that um, is something that happens commonly. And, and even for things that aren't sexual, like, like as you said, people who don't get enough attention maybe from their parents or uh, maybe from their friends growing up, um, just, just they, they, they develop the habit of attention seeking. Mm -hmm. And then people ten, can take a, advantage of that as well. So it's not always that these people do go about you know, seeking sexual attention, but it could just be that they want genuine attention and love and appreciation. Mm. And people see that and take advantage of them mm. because they see what this person is willing to do to get that attention that they're looking for. Mm. So I would say that certainly is a factor um, mm. when, when some people um, do, do fall into sexual sin. Mm. Mm, yeah. Jill, I, I saw your face moving a little bit over here. I know that usually oh, means that no. your, your thoughts are churning. No, I'm just, I'm just thinking about yes to emotional response and emotional trauma. I don't know, and I just, I just started thinking about um, how sometimes I think about these topics and then I'm just like, I don't know, I guess it's just between them and God. And at the end of the day, God knows their heart. And I started thinking about, um, once again, just willingness to be transformed. Because I think we do do a lot of things based on our upbringing, based on us either running to something, which is usually running from something. And I think about how, you know, we, we you know, may use sex as one of those things. Um, and I think it just speaks to how much people are not willing to change because they're so, at, at some point, they're kind of stuck in their ways, and we always complain about, you know, people above us being stuck in their ways, mm. but I think we are too. And then there's, I think there's a point in one's life where, you know, depending on what you're doing, what you're doing for, you have to think, like, when am I ready to turn my life around? When mm. am I ready, I guess, to just draw the line, mm -hmm. you know, and even with um, thinking about them and their relationship with God and God being able to bring them out, you know, out of whatever they need to be brought out of, that still goes back to them being even willing to host a relationship with God, to maintain a relationship with God, and to listen to Him when He's um, talking to them. So, I don't know. I was like, I was spacing out and thinking about all this stuff. No, um, that's good. So. <laughs> I, I like that, and I think that's a good way to end, too. Um, you know, we're definitely not judging anybody who, who has decided that they weren't going to wait or who who ended up having sex outside of marriage. I mean, like I confessed, I, I did when I was growing up, mm. um, but I saw the value in it as I got older. So judgment doesn't help anybody. We're just trying to bring out the fact that, you know, if God did say to wait, then mm. there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And it's not because he's trying to keep you from anything, it's because he's trying to give you the best that um, the best life, the best wife, the best husband, the best relationship that he can give you. And a lot of that is following um, the, the rules, the directives, the principles that he's given us in the Bible. So you keep, keep, uh, keep doing your best, keep trying. If you fall in, just get up and keep going. And like Jill was saying, just connect with Jesus. Take time to connect with him. And I guarantee that you'll, you'll start to see a difference. You'll start to experience a difference. He'll start to fill those needs and those voids for you. Well, we're so glad that you joined us on this episode. Uh, I pray that this discussion has been a blessing to you all. We'll be back on next week. And on next week, we're going to start dealing with the topic of, Christ, of entertainment. Entertainment. What kind of entertainment should we as Christians engage in? Ooh. What should we soak in? <laughs> We're going to talk about Christian entertainment. So thank you for joining us here on Verified Live from Oakwood University. We'll see you on next week. God bless. Peace.